Welcome to the Ecom Breakthrough Podcast. Are you ready to unlock the full potential and growth in your business? You've already crossed seven figures in sales, but the challenge is knowing how to take your business to the next level. Join Josh Hadley, an eight-figure e-com business owner and investor, as he interviews highly successful business owners. Get ready, because you're going to learn specific actions you can take today to help your business reach its full potential and leave a lasting impact on the world. Welcome to the Ecom Breakthrough Podcast. I'm your host, Josh Hadley, where I interview the top business leaders in e-commerce. Past guests include Roland Frazier, Kevin King, and Stephen Pope. Today, I'm speaking with Harry Joyner, President and CEO of E-Commerce Recruiter, and we will be talking a lot about business strategy, hiring, and building teams to scale. This episode is brought to you by Ecom Breakthrough Consulting, where I help seven-figure companies grow to eight figures and beyond. I made a lot of mistakes along the way that made the path of getting my business to eight figures take a little bit longer. At times, I doubted whether our business could even survive and become a real brand. I wish I would have had a guide to help me grow faster and avoid many of those stumbling blocks. If you've hit similar plateaus and want to know the next steps to take your business to the next level, then go to ecombreakthrough.com. That's ecom with two M's to learn more. And before introducing today's guest, I want to give a big shout out to Stephen Pope of My Amazon Guy and go check out his website, myamazonguy.com. They are a team of seasoned Amazon experts to help brands to optimize their listings and succeed on, on Amazon. They have created a layered strategy using proven tactics to manage PPC, SEO, as well as the back-end catalog. But today, I'm super excited to introduce you to Harry Joyner. Harry is described by SearchEngineWatch.com as a dominant recruiter in client-side multi-channel multi e-commerce space. He is an executive recruiter for marketing and e-commerce. He has been interviewed by Success Magazine, and he has appeared in the Wall Street Journal, Marketing Sherpa's Great Minds in Marketing series, Business Week, USAToday.com, Internet Retailer, and many more. He has closed dozens of manager, director, VP, and C-level e-commerce searches for some of the following companies, A&E Television, Adidas, American Signature Brands, Ashford.com, Backcountry.com, BootBarn.com, Columbia Sportswear, and many, many more. So welcome to the podcast, Harry. Thank you so much. Great to be here. Well, I'm super excited to be having this conversation with you, Harry. I, uh, you know, Stephen Pope had so many great things to say about you. And I know we jumped on a call last week and, you know, we had a fantastic call. Frankly, I was blown away with the mindset shifts that you shared with me while we were on a quick, you know, 20 minute phone call and your approach to not only business strategy, but it, when it comes to hiring and the way that you approach, you know, hiring a level talent um, for different brands. So, Harry, I would love to kind of rewind the tapes and get to know you a little bit more and, and tell me, how did you get started with e-commerce recruiter to begin with? Oh, gosh, um, gosh, I was a frozen food trader in the 1990s. I worked for a company called uh, AJC International. You can see them online now at AJCGroup.com. And I left that firm, so for, I did that for seven years in the 90s. It was an absolutely unbelievable experience. And then I left the firm in 99 to go to work as uh, an angel round investor and director of trading operations for globalfoodexchange.com, which was started by uh, some McKinsey fellows. Uh, we raised about 30 million bucks. We did that for about two years, um, a little more than two years, and we sold out to iTrade Network. And then after that, it was a recession, and I bounced around Atlanta, uh, interviewed in a number of different places, and I just wound up working for uh, a recruiting firm, just as a contingency recruiter, which basically means, um, and I'm still a contingency recruiter, which means every deal that I take is completely on spec. Um, your the audience might ask how I charge. So I, I charge and always have charged 20% of the candidates first to your base salary if and only if the client hires the candidate. So uh, as my brother likes to kid me, gunslingers don't get paid by the bullet. Um, it's a straight commission thing. Uh, no money changes hands unless uh, the client hires my candidate. And um, that just always appealed to me. And so I'm a contingency recruiter 
to this day. Um, I work for a little agency here in Atlanta, helping them build an omni-channel e-com uh, business. This is way back in 2003 or 2004. And then in 2005, I decided to just go into business for myself. And so uh, I set up uh, a home office that was in a different home, but it's but today it's very much the same concept, you know. I mean, this is this is what I look like. Clearly, I thought <laughs> this was going to be an audio interview or a video interview, but but it really doesn't make any difference to me because the only thing that typically matters in my line of work is how I sound, you know. And so I work from home, and we'll get called by I think 150 companies this year, people wanting us to handle their e-commerce searches. There's only two of us in our firm, me, and I've got a partner in my business named Alan Seibert. And uh, Alan and I will take about 50 of those deals. So it's uh, nice work if you can get it, right? Yeah, very, very impressive. Well, you obviously have an extensive background and you've seen a lot, uh, especially as in terms of the e-commerce industry has changed a lot over the last two decades, let alone over the last decade alone and, and more changes are continually on the way. Uh, but Harry, I think what's interesting there, you mentioned, you know, you have a small firm, right? You, you're well experienced. Your results speak for themselves. If people go check out your LinkedIn profile, there's raving reviews of people that have worked with Harry. Um, so Harry, 150, you know, companies are going to apply to kind of w hire your services. What, what are you looking for as you kind of determine what are the 50 you're going to work, work with? What's the difference between those that you say no to versus the ones that you say yes to and why? Sure. It's a great question. Um, well, so when people pitch us on a deal, so they pitch me and Alan, and it's a little bit like if you've ever seen a concept pitched on Shark Tank, it's a little bit like that. Um, Alan and I are very particular about the deals that we take. And I think I learned this watching Entourage back in the, you know, 2000s. 2000, whenever, 8 through 12 yep. or something, that in Hollywood, the richest actors aren't the richest actors because they're the best actors. They're the richest actors because they get the best scripts. It's a lot like that as an e-commerce recruiter. So we like searches that can be closed on the back of a single story, right? So the brand, the, you know, the client, they know what their business is about and who their business is for, and what their unique selling proposition is. So why should anyone do business with them versus any option available to them, uh, including doing nothing? Um, we look for the underlying economics of the client's business. So do we understand how they make money? Do they understand how they make money? Do they understand how they're going to make money in the future? We tend to take a good, hard look um, at things like size and scope of a 12-month file. We'll look at things like average order value. We'll look at things like recurring revenue and order frequency. We'll look at um, what it takes to actually bring that concept to, to life, you know, the purpose and values and viewpoint of the brand. And we'll, we'll look at a variety of different factors to try and determine whether our audience, um, which is the top 3% of people in the e-commerce industry. I mean, 97% of the candidates that watch this podcast aren't going to, they're, they're not, we wouldn't represent them on a deal anyway, because we're out there looking for load bearing walls. Yeah. I mean, th this sounds super salesy, but the fact of the matter is when people come to me and Alan, uh, they expect us to be in the organizational transformation business, right? You come to us looking for a Steph Curry, a Michael Jordan, a Tom Brady. That's that, and, and it is like being an agent in Holly. And can, the best candidates in the industry, the people who are capable of plugging and playing and being a load bearing wall in our clients' business, they want to make sure that they can do reputation enhancing work. That's really what it boils down to. And that means that in terms of the search, the client has the budget, the authority, the need, the timeline, and the hiring process to knock good candidates in versus knock them out. And um, that the business has favorable underlying economics, that the client has clarity and, and ability and resolve, you know, commitment towards e -com. And those are the things, honestly, that you need for an A player to do reputation enhancing work 
in your business. Yeah. I love the, the strategy that, or the analogy that you made there with, you know, hiring like the Michael Jordans or Steph Curry's, right? If you think about that, you know, as a business owner, right? If you want to attract a Michael Jordan or a Steph Curry, right? If, if you're an NBA owner, you've got to have a good team, right? And you've got to have a good vision and say, hey, here's the teammates that you'd be working alongside. Here's, here's where we can go if we bring you onto the team. That's going to attract those A-level, you know, talent and players to your team. Whereas if you're kind of confused, you don't have good economics behind your business, you don't know your numbers, you might be a little wishy-washy with your strategy, right? Or your vision for the business, you're not going to get that A-level talent to come join your team because I think it's it's definitely like a recruiting process. Like you have to sell somebody to your business at the end of the day. Um, Harry, many of our listeners are established businesses that, you know, they probably built a, a small team maybe at this point, but it's probably a few players. They're making seven figures. They want to go to eight figures and beyond, right? What are some of the things and best practices that you would recommend, you know, business owners should be focused on now if they want to get to that a point where they would be hiring your services, where they are that 3%, uh, that very selective group of the audience that you would even consider working with? Well, this sounds crazy, but so I've been doing this since 2004, five hours a day, five days a week, 50 weeks a year. That's my connect time on the telephone all day, every day, talking to um, entrepreneurs, right? Um, whose businesses typically are between $5 million and $75 million in sales. So let's just clarify, when, it, when I say anything for the rest of this um, podcast, it's like my slam dunk customer is an entrepreneur who runs an, a business that's omnichannel, typically or primarily online retailer between $5 million and $75 million in sales. Why that range, right? Well, what I've discovered is that less than $5 million in sales, and they usually don't have enough money to pay me, yep. and more than $75 million in sales, and they usually have a guy like me on their team. Right? And more than $75 million in sales, um, what I find is that they're not really willing to take my ideas about what they should be doing. Now, this isn't necessarily ego talking, right? But it's, it's a little like being a physician in the sense that I treat entrepreneurs with a particular type of malady all day, every day. And I, you know, I'm, I certainly recognize it when I see it. You know, it's... Most people come to me, they're looking for reliable growth. That's what they're looking for. And so what does that mean? You know, there's good growth, there's bad growth, there's cash flow positive growth. Some companies are making a sale to get a customer. Some companies are getting a customer to make a sale. It's just, and so you have to kind of ask yourself, like, so what's my ideal outcome of owning this business? Yeah. You have to ask that question. You just... It's a lifestyle business. Like, clearly, I'm running a lifestyle business. I'm not trading on my good looks here, right? <laughs> um, but for some people that are, I don't know, the first part of their career, let's say between 30 and 45 years old, running a $5 million to $75 million thing, it's like, well, the first person to live to be 150 years old has been born. So let's say you're 40 years old. And you're going to run your business for another seven to 10 years, and then you're going to go do something else. Well, you got a career path just like everybody else has a career path. And you kind of have to look at that and say, okay, if, I, if my goal is to have my reputation precede me as an entrepreneur and to have done reputation enhancing work leading this business, right? What does that look like? And when I was a kid, my dad, who built an enormous business uh, here in Georgia, it's now like the 10th or 12th largest privately held company in Georgia. He and his partner founded it. And today they're, you know, it's a $2 billion thing. So it's wow. enormous and he's outrageously successful. He used to say, your business strategy should be your exit strategy. Don't build it if you can't sell it. So, okay, that all sounds reasonable. If we say, okay, our business strategy should be our exit strategy. What, what does that mean? Business strategy should be your exit strategy. What, what happens, you know, if we sell this thing in five years? What does that look like? And in the thousands of phone calls that I've had, both with private equity people and with um, 
entrepreneurs around the internet retailer top 500, the shop.org, NRF, community, whatever. What I've come to find is that there are six things that happen to any business. Six things. It's like death and taxes with people. They're going to die. They're going to pay taxes. That's, we know that for sure. Well, there are six outcomes for any business, whether you're Google, Amazon, Facebook, Eliminate, Stand, here are your six outcomes. Number one, you sell to a strategic buyer. Number two, you sell to a financial buyer. Number three, you sell it to your employees. Number four, uh, sell it to your employees. Number four, you go out of business. How could I forget? Or number five, you die in possession. Is that six, five? I forget. Sell it to a strategic buyer. Sell it to a financial buyer. Sell it to your employees. Go out of business. Die in possession. Five. Okay. So you have to look at that and say, okay, which of those is most attractive to me? Well, Probably not sell to a financial buyer. Probably going to, and I, I may or may not be able to sell to my employees. Sometimes you can, right? Sometimes your employees are just, they're not that great. I mean, I talk to entrepreneurs all day, every day. You've got a dull, boring institutional concept in your business. You got dull, boring institutional people, pedestrian people working in your business. Are you really going to sell your business to them? Uh, maybe, maybe not. Yeah. Right. So, at the end of that, you have to say, well, I don't want to die of this. I don't want to die in possession. So that leaves me with sell to a strategic buyer. So let's say you, you say, I'm going to sell to a strategic buyer. Now, who's the strategic buyer? Don't build it if I can't sell it. Business strategy should be your exit strategy. Why would somebody buy me? And then basically what you're doing as an entrepreneur is you're working all the time to reconcile what the business is about and who the business is for. And why should somebody choose to do business with your firm versus any option available to them, including doing nothing? And you're trying to, you know, whip up a constellation of stakeholders, whether they are investors or employees or banks or vendors or or customers or whomever. You're trying to whip up a constellation of them around your business based on a concept, based on an operating model, based on financials, based on what's in it for them. And anybody does business with you because it's reputation enhancing for them. And you have to figure out what's reputation enhancing for you and the guy who's going to buy you in seven to 10 years. And that's, honest to God, the stories that I've seen unfold between, in the last, I've been doing this for 18 years, the stories that I've seen unfold in that band between five and $75 million have been amazing. And I've seen some people go out of business or get hit by a bus or whatever. And I've seen some people sell to strategic buyers and make a lot of money. And it's always really exciting when that happens. Yeah. Well, Harry, I, I think that's an amazing, you know, way to approach business, right? I love that starting your business strategy should be your exit strategy. And I think that is like the first step that any of us listening to this podcast should be focused on right now and having a clear vision of like, what am I driving towards, right? Is this going to be a long term, like I'm just selling it to myself, I'm going to own it for eternity? Or is this like, you need to start building it towards a strategic buyer. And as you do that, I think it shifts your mindset in terms of the different strategies that you would employ, um, you know, to further that the overall business strategy. So I love that. And Harry, you have so many examples and case studies that I want to dive into. Um, so why don't you share some of those? Let's start maybe with a, a successful, you know, case study here where, you know, tell us where the brand started from, right? Uh, obviously we're between five to 75 million. Um, who was it that, you know, you worked with to uh, bring onto their team and you know, what are some of the strategies or things that they did and, what was the end outcome, right? I think you mentioned some of them have even sold to strategic buyers, which is excellent. And then on the flip side, you know, what have you seen in terms of people that have gone out of business? What were some of the failures or mistakes that everybody should be learning from that you've seen? Yeah, it's funny. I, I didn't realize you're going to ask that question. I'm glad you did. Um, I'm sitting here looking at it's a spreadsheet basically that I've made for myself of all of our, receivables in the deals that we've done. I mean, there are a lot of, like we've closed deals for Academy Sports. Academy Sports has been very successful. We've closed deals with My Patriot Supply. They were successful. We closed deals with, uh, oh God, 
uh, Bulk Reef Supply. There's a company that's now private equity backed that was very successful. Big name commerce, very successful. Um, I guess I'll see if I can answer that with some generalities. So in general, what I see is that, okay, so you think of growth, I guess you're on the other side. So if I go up, like, okay, so growth goes like this, or does growth go like this to you, right? Yeah, so, that, that, way, that way worked right there. Okay, so it goes like yep. that. All right. So typically what happens is people want to grow between, let's call it 20 and 30% per year. And it's hard to do that. And most of what I see is that entrepreneurs figure out that they need a VP of e-commerce or chief marketing officer who can turn marketing from an art into a science. They want it to be more process driven. So up until let's say 10 to $15 million in sales, and it completely depends on the average order value. It depends on whether or not it's B2B or B2C, whether or not the company sells a product or a service, domestic or international, whatever. It's, there's no one size fits all example that I could give you uh, as an answer to this question. Yeah. But it seems like once the company gets to about $15 million a year, they want to turn marketing more into a process. And they want a process for acquiring customers, improving the average order value, and improving the order frequency. The model that we use to help people step through this is something called the ANSOF matrix. Right? Okay. So if you Google ANSOF matrix, it's a two by two grid that says there's four ways to grow any business, period, end of story, lemonade stand, airline, doesn't matter. You sell old products to old customers, old products to new customers, new products to old customers, and new products to new customers. That's how you do it. And so it starts with a financial calculator and you say, okay, we're at $15 million now and we want to be at $50 million in five years. What's the compound annual growth rate? I don't know what that compound annual growth rate is. Let's say it's 20% per year. It's like, okay, so any combination of old to old, old to new, new to new, and new to old is going to get me there. What am I doing right that I should do more of? old to old, old to new, new to old, new to new? What am I doing wrong that I should stop doing? Old to old, old to new, new to old, new to new. What's my competitor doing that I should copy? Old to old, old to new, new to old, new to new. What's nobody doing that somebody should do? Old to old, new to new, new to old, new to new. And it's just, it's a wash, rinse, repeat kind of thing. Yeah. Right? Where you're saying, okay, at the end of the day, my business strategy is my exit strategy. Don't build it if I can't sell it. I want to sell to a strategic buyer. Roughly, who's my strategic buyer, right? Why would they acquire me? Am I building a brand? Am I building something that's based on a supply chain? Am I build? you know, is it going to be based on some unique way of selling? Like, mm -hmm. um, I don't know, back in the day, uh, I think it was Tupperware was sold door to door, you know? So there are like certain businesses that are built on the back of a particular sales and marketing model or whatever. And you kind of have to go, okay, so what's the secret sauce in my business? And is that scalable? And is it going to be the basis for a competitive advantage and a unique, unique selling proposition going forward? And how can I build around that? Um, business that comes to mind is Domino's. Right, they were the only game in town when they started. It was the unique selling proposition: the fresh hot pizza, thirty minutes or less, or it's free. They even had a guarantee around it. They launched it on college campuses. It was an enormous hit, and the rest yeah. is history. And that was a concept that scaled, and none of the other pizza joints wanted anything to do with it because they had a legacy infrastructure that was all about restaurants. And they were like, "If you guys want to do delivery, we've tried it before, and it didn't work." be our guest. And they literally let Domino's have a free run at that. This is a similar kind of thing where you have to look at sort of dimly, directionally correctly at the future and say, where's the hole in the market going to be? And what does my unique selling proposition have to be? What does my operating model have to be? What are the underlying economics of that business going to look like? Who's my slam dunk customer? I mean, Everybody that touches your business, whether they're a supplier, whether they're a customer, whether they're a banker, whether they're an employee, whether they're a spouse of an employee, basically you're getting those people to go on a journey with you. Right. Right. And so they're, and they're constantly asking themselves, why should I be here? 
what's in it for me? Is this is being connected with this organization going to is it going to help? Is it going to improve my reputation? Is it going to improve my knowledge about the business or whatever going forward? And so you're constantly, it's a contest of wills, yours versus everybody else's. And you're constantly seeking to drive that thing forward. That's a real challenge. Yeah. No, I, I hear you. And I love the, the there's only four ways to, to grow a business. I, I like that approach and it's very systematic, right? And I think each business owner could look at each of those four buckets and say, what's my strategy for, you know, old products to old customers. And, you know, there's so many rabbit holes that you can dive into from there. Um, Harry, I want to ask you, you know, you mentioned, um, I think it was tuck it, uh, jeans or whatever it was that you, you had mentioned where their, their main business proposition or strategy was selling door to door, right? That was kind of like their sales channel. Now, for a lot of people in the e-commerce space, uh, for many people, they've built brands on Amazon, right? And Amazon is their main sales channel. Amazon has 98% of their sales. Even if they have a D2C website, Amazon is still like the dominant channel there. What are your thoughts about, you know, diversifying yourself off of Amazon or, you know, for a potential strategic exit, do you lean into Amazon further and be like, look, this is my core capability we are wicked smart and we do amazing things on Amazon. And that's maybe why, uh, you know, a strategic acquirer would want to acquire your business is to say, Hey, yeah, bring your team, your products and your Amazon knowledge to us because that's, that's a gap that we've been missing in our own business. Uh, what are your thoughts on Amazon and, and needing to diversify off of it or no, like kind of stay the course and double down. You're in the emotional bond business. At the end of the day, it's like Peter Drucker used to say, the whole purpose of a business is to create and keep a customer. And one of the terms that we use in our business, I don't know where this came from, maybe we made it up, but we, we like to say the best businesses are the ones that embrace SAFA, S-A-F-A, which SAFA to us stands for start anywhere, finish anywhere. So, a customer may start at a store and then get a catalog and then go to Amazon and buy. They may see your stuff at a Walmart, then they see it down the street at a Target, then go to Amazon and buy. Or they could go to your DTC site, then go to your mobile site, then get retargeted to somewhere else, then go to a Walmart and buy. Or somebody could this, that, and the other thing, and maybe they call a call center. It's like... Right. You just, you want to turn your funnel, whatever that is, into a grease shoot. So you have to understand the built-in biases of the who, like who the customer is and how they think and how they buy and how they make decisions. And is there a built-in bias to the way they make decisions? And you want to sell to the customer the way they buy and the way they feel better about themselves because of their relationship with your brand. Basically, you're in the emotional bond business. Yeah. So some people feel like they can do that best on Amazon, and some people can. I mean, if I were selling batteries, one time we did a search for Energizer, and Energizer wanted to be all things to all people as long as Energizer could sell them on Amazon. But this is a long time ago. I don't know what Energizer is doing. Now. But in a business like batteries where it's where there's a gazillion reasons that you would want to get your batteries from Amazon, subscribe and save or as an add-on whenever you buy a toy or whatever. Yeah. I don't want to get into all that. But I mean, for some businesses, it's like, look, we're just going to continue to sell on Amazon. That's fine. At a certain point, you have to understand that when you sell on Amazon, you're feeding the army that's going to attack you <laughs> with, without exception. Yeah. Their, your margin is their opportunity. We've all heard that, right? And so be careful, right? Because Amazon is a cruel mistress. And yeah. so ask yourself, I mean, you know, I'm not McKinsey. I didn't go to Harvard, right? I went to an average business school. And just the, the only thing that allows me to just wrap out all of this crap so slickly is just the fact that I've done it all day. That's the only thing that qualifies me to have this conversation at all. And the benefit of that is that none of what I'm saying here is like that strategic. You know, like just ask yourself, if we were going west and we just decided we were going to go west, we we're going to take a motorcycle trip, we were going to go west, does it matter 
for the first 500 miles, as long as we're going west, what, you know, whether broadly we're going to Seattle or San Diego, no. Like, we are really only going to start making real decisions that are going to, like, impact the final destination in our business once we get to about Arkansas or Oklahoma or Colorado or whatever. Then we're going to start making some decisions. But until then, all you have to be is just directionally correct. And it's like that with an entrepreneur. If you say, look, all I know is that in seven years, I want to sell to a strategic buyer. Like, that's enough. Today, if all anybody got out of me was like, gee, that's an interesting dude. And, you know, that's the bit about being directionally correct was enough. Just go west, sell to a strategic buyer if that's, in fact, what you want to do, or sell to your employees if that's what you want to do. And then if you say, okay, I want to sell to a strategic buyer in seven years, who possibly is the strategic buyer, right? Because, like, I'm making this up. This has nothing to do with anything specific here. But let's just say, for example, you had a little brand and you thought you wanted to sell to a pharma company in seven years. Well, whether okay. or not you sell to Johnson & Johnson versus Merck, that's, they're both pharma companies, but they do radically different things. And both have driving forces and strategic thrusts that are very different. If you sell to J&J, you're selling to or Glaxo, you're selling to a consumer health company more than if you're selling to Pfizer or Merck, you're selling to, a, you know, and so what they acquire from you, what Pfizer or Merck might acquire from you would be something more like you'd be required to have more, you know, pharma expertise or biology expertise on staff or R&D expertise on staff or whatever. Whereas if you sold to J&J, they're really going to buy a brand. So it's like just knowing that helps you staff up And okay, fine. Broadly, now I'm going to go get people who know how to build a pharma brand. I'm going to go get people who know how to sell Amazon One P, for example. And my next Amazon hire, for example, is going to understand targeted emails and they're going to understand, you know, A plus content. They're going to understand EDI integration and vendor lead time and fast track eligibility and stuff like that. It's just, if you know directionally where you're going, that crap can inform the little decisions that you make today. You just want to paint in broad strokes. That was long, yeah. but you get the point. Yeah. No, I, I like that. And I think that's a fantastic takeaway. It kind of leads me in to my next question here. You know, even for our own brand, we've, we've crossed eight figures here. We, um, you know, 10.5 million is what we'll do this year. We are wanting to go to that 50 million in the next five years, right? We, we are planning to exit our business to a strategic acquire. That is our plan. So personal question I'd be asking you, Harry, is like, how do we determine which, uh, you know, what is the next best hire for us to genuinely take our business to the next level? Is it, you know, a director of e-commerce or is it a CMO, you know, um, that can run all of the marketing? How do I, you know, and, and maybe, from your experience of these 150 people that apply to work with you, do they come to you knowing what specifically is like, I need a CMO. This is specifically what I'm looking for. Or do they come to you kind of with the same question of like, I know I want to take my business to the next level, but what are the specific roles we should be adding right now? And which ones should be added at the right time? Okay. So for your viewers, if you go to harryjoiner.com, H-A-R-R-J-O-I-N-E-R.com, that resolves to my LinkedIn profile. And a lot of people really seem to dig my content. I have 26,000 followers on LinkedIn, and it's a very engaged audience, and they're all e-commerce people, and they're, those people are very smart. Those people are the genuine article. You'll see under my previous post, a posting that I did where this is, let me go back to our screen. Okay, so this is, excuse me. Okay, my screen just locked up. Okay, can you see this? Yes, I can. Okay, so there's a there's a posting that I wrote about this. Um, I totally made this up, right? But this is an example of what I'm talking about, right? So let's say that somebody today has a business that's $17 million in sales, right? And let's say that in 2026, they want 
thirty-two million dollars in sales. Can, is my light washing that out? Can you see that? No, no, I can still see it. Yeah. Okay, you can see that. All right. And so we know that in aggregate, from seventeen to thirty-two over four years, is a seventeen point one three percent compound annual growth rate. Okay. okay. Now. This posting, which has got this picture in it, so if your people go to harryjoiner.com, you can look at this posting, and I step people through the math here, which is, this is the answer to your question. Okay, right here. good. Okay. So what, what we hear a lot is that people say, well, here's how big we are today, and we want to be this big in the future, but they never say, here's how we expect our channel mix to evolve. Mm. And how your channel mix evolves is freaking huge. Okay, so you remember a little while ago I said you're going on a journey and your st all of your stakeholders are going to go with you, your customers, your spouses of your employees, your employees, your vendor, all of that. Yep. So you're on a big, it's a big wagon train that's going west. And we don't know if we're going to go to Seattle or San Diego. We'll figure it out when we get to Oklahoma. Remember that? Okay. Okay. So we basically said 17 is east, 32 is west. And now but what we see is that over the next four years, we would like DTC, which is currently $5 million, to grow to 19. And we would like Amazon, which is currently $4 million of the 17. We'd like to phase that out because we're feeding the army that's going to attack us, right? And then we want, excuse me, B2B to grow from 8 to 13. Okay, okay. now... This is, this is what I do. This is, I think, what makes me different than most contingency recruiters is that I, I'm not, I, I have an aptitude and an interest in doing this kind of stuff, but I have tons of resources to help me figure it out on a per case basis. And again, sales pitch for anybody who cares, I work on a contingency basis. So when you call me as an entrepreneur of a five to $75 million, this is the animal that you're going to get. Bad head <laughs> and everything, this is it. Right? I love it. And so we're going to figure out what your channel mix is going to be. Now, remember, when we get to, what did we say here? Uh, when we get to $32 million in sales, notice what happens to B2B. B2B grows at 13%, but DTC grows at 40% per year. Okay, yeah. so that's, that's a biggie. So you would ask the question, what kind of people do you have, do you have to hire? Well, first of all, you have to hire growth-oriented people. But For you sure. have to hire people who really understand the mechanics of selling DTC. Because if your business strategy is your exit strategy, don't build it if you can't sell it. This is what we're building. Maybe this is where we are, but this is what we're building. Right? Yep. So what does this mean? Well, it means we got to sell old to old, old to new, new to old, new to new. Once we get there, right? We got to have customers and average order value and order frequency, right? Yep. We got to have the digital marketing trifecta paid on the earned media. We have to have a plan for all of that. We have to have a plan for being in the emotional bond business with the customer who buys from us at this point. Right. Right? So it's like if you do fantasy football, if you know anything about football, you know, or even hockey, Wayne Gretzky said, skate to where the puck will be. Tom Brady isn't throwing to the person. He's like leading the person. Right. You know, 10 yards ahead or whatever, that, how that works in the moment for Tom Brady. This is, you're building an organization for here with the team you have here. Mm. So you're constantly asking yourself, do I have the right people on the bus? Is the bus going in the right place? Do I have the right people in the right seats? Yeah. Right? And what a lot of entrepreneurs do, and I like the bus example, that's a Jim Collins thing from good to great, love it. Yep. But you, your customer's going on a journey, your employee's going on a journey, your bankers are going on a journey. Your suppliers are going on a journey. You're all, you all have to crowd into the bus, right? And so some customers are going to be ankle-biting jackasses, and they need to be thrown off the bus, right? Right. And some stakeholders, bankers or whatever, they're going to be ankle-biting jackasses too, and they need to be shown the door, et cetera. So you're constantly working to trade up. Interesting. And what I'm looking for and I realize I sound like a little bit like a kook when I say all this, like, Jesus Christ, this guy's a handful. But like what I see is that it's all it's all about managing these stakeholders and understanding broadly 
where you're going, directionally where you're going. And as you get closer to about Arkansas, then you're starting to make real decisions about, okay, th this is who I'm getting on my bus. If my average tenure here among my employees is three years, and I'm at your two and a half here, and I've got two and a, okay, so then unless I fire them, the people that I hire today are still gonna be around. Yeah. So I have to start looking at their ability to think strategically about stuff, to metabolize change, to see the business and our value proposition through the eyes of the customer, to make customers feel better about themselves because of their relationship with the brand. You gotta do all of that stuff. Yeah. And it takes drivers. It takes people who are drivers. Yeah. And it takes people who are insatiably curious about all of this stuff. I'm, I personally am restlessly curious. This is not a sales pitch. I'm restlessly curious about all of this stuff. I'm obsessed with the plight of the $5 million to $75 million entrepreneur because I was raised by one. I've got other entrepreneurs that, that are at that level in my family. That's who we are, and it's, it's a values thing for me. I'm all it's just all about that. I love capitalism, and I love democracy, and I'm just strikingly about those two things. Yeah, no, I, I love this, and I, I love that approach, Harry. I think like being able to have a clear vision and always ask, asking yourself who's on the bus and who needs to continue to be on the bus. You know, if this is the destination that we're heading to, right? Because I know the you know, the old adage is the people that got you here are probably not the people that are going to get you there, um, except with some rare exceptions, I think. Right. And so I think that's what you're talking about is like, you've got to have those players that you add on that can think strategically and level up your game. Because if you just think by, you know, brute force, you're going to, you know, will your way to, you know, that higher value, I, I, you're not going to get there. So another question I wanted to ask on this note here, Harry, is, you know, we're talking about ha adding the very capable team member to the team. Now, you're you're going out and recruiting some of the best talent in the world um, for these brands. How do you weed out, you know, the wheat from the chaff, uh, so to speak? Right. How do you know this is the this guy is really good versus, uh, you know, I think there's maybe some better talent out there and. Maybe what are some pointers that people could apply even to their own internal hiring processes, even if they're hiring somebody at just like a customer service level? Um, what are some of those things that you're looking for in a level talent that says to you, this guy's good. This guy would be like a good people, fit. Yeah, I like people who um, are smart. I mean, you can tell when somebody's smart. I, li I like to be intimidated, frankly. When I first started recruiting, I look like, you know, I've been a recruiter for 18 years. I'm in my late 50s. So I've been around forever. Uh, when I first started recruiting 18 years ago, I had a real problem with, like, panic, you know, and, like, fear of the phone for the first probably year and a half that I did it. And, you know, before I would call a VP of e-commerce, there wasn't a big list of VPs of e-commerce, um, my palms would sweat. And I would just be like, oh, my God, you know, and you know, they would freaking sweat. It was annoying as hell. Yeah. And over time, what I learned was the people who were in the top 3% of the industry are the people typically who make my palms sweat. Mm. And over time, I began to link a lot of pleasure to the fact that I was getting sweaty palms. Interesting. And that now, I look like that's the canary in the coal mine. If I'm on the phone with a candidate and they start asking me a bunch of questions about, okay, so you say your company is, a, you say your client has a $50 million business. What percentage of that is B2B versus B2C? Okay, so $25 million DTC business. Okay, let's talk about that. What percentage of that is third-party markets versus DTC, where they have a website and shopping cart, et cetera? Yeah. Right. Now, what percentage of that is mobile versus desktop? And what percentage of that is, you know, where's that traffic coming from? Is it, you know, direct, organic, paid, referral, you know, social? Like, And then I realized, like, oh, shit. They've got more questions than I got answers, and I my palms start to sweat. Yeah. So I'm a very insecure person, very insecure. And over time, I've learned that actually my insecurities are a feature. They're not a bug. I love my insecurities. That's where the money is. And so if you're on the phone with a candidate who they know their numbers, they ask great questions about your business, right? 
Who's on the team? What agencies are you using? How, what's your cost per lead? What's your cost per sale? What are you doing to drive traffic and improve an average order by improving conversion rate? What platform are you on? What are you doing right that you should do more of? What are you doing wrong that you should stop doing? What's your competitor doing that you should copy? What is nobody doing that somebody should do? And all of a sudden, if you're an entrepreneur and you're just like, I don't know, perfect. That's what you want. You yeah. want that candidate who's got more questions than you got answers. Now, yeah. footnote, for the basic stuff that you're actually hiring for, they have to be able to give you ear, right? Example, action, result. Yeah. So let's say you need somebody who has amazing Amazon 3P chops today. Okay. okay. So make sure they have the 3P chops today for planning and forecasting for, you know, Amazon advertising or whatever it is. Make sure you get what you came for. But the stuff that's going to get you here is just being able to think aggressively about the underlying economics of the business. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, makes a lot of sense. And, you know, even as I look back on the team members that we have hired and we recently hired a VP of operations for our business. And to be honest, as, as I go back, I, I don't think I've ever like come to this realization until I spoke with you about this. And you kind of shared those insights where honestly, the, the candidates that have been the best that we have ended up hiring are honestly the ones that I was kind of most nervous for going into their interviews where I was like, I need to come prepared because I know they're going to ask difficult questions. They're going like, I almost feel like I'm going to need to sell them on my own business and establish the fact that like we have our crap together and yes. we need to bring them onto our team. Like I still need to be knowledgeable enough. Like um, for example, with our VP of operations, I spent probably a good half a day gathering all of like our financial data gathering and looking at what's our average order value, what, you know, what percentage of sales are coming from different channels? Uh, you know, how many products did we launch this year? How many products are we planning to launch next year? So like just lots of numbers, right? What are our margins? What's our gross profit? Uh, all of it. Right. Because I knew that was going to be a question asked there. And sure enough, on those during that conversation, you know, he was fairly impressed. He was like, ah, oh, you came very prepared with like your numbers, you know, your stuff. And it, it went both ways, right? Like I was impressed with the questions he was asking because that's the type of person that I need on my team. That's going to push me to ask the difficult questions. But then number two, he then was like, wow, this, this business knows where they're going. They know their numbers. They're not just kind of throwing things around and hoping things stick. They have a clear vision and action plan of how to get there. They just need that extra talent to take them to the next level. Is Would you agree? Is that a kind of a fair assessment to that yeah, statement? Totally. I mean, the, the best people in the industry, I really I hate to put this out there because you know, my competitors will see it and they'll learn from it. But, but the fact of the matter is, A players, the people who have game changer DNA, they want to do reputation enhancing work. Yeah. Well, the, the example that I always give is that people forget that John Travolta took a pay cut to play the part of Vincent Vega in Pulp, in Pulp Fiction. Mm. He did. He worked for scale, whatever the SAG scale was. It was $20,000 a week or whatever. But people forget that, like, he'd already been on the cover of Rolling Stone magazine and was a known quantity in Hollywood and was a star. But he was he wanted a job. That he wanted a career opportunity that would bring massive transformational value to him. He knew he could bring massive transformational value to the project. Yeah. But he was looking for, you know, a part that would allow him to recast himself as something dark and funky and gritty and sexy and edgy. And he, he, that wasn't Benny Barbarino from Welcome. Mm. Right. So, and so, yeah. The, it, it's one of those things where you, you don't have to. You know, you're not shooting Titanic in your business. Yeah. Right. You you can shoot Reservoir Dogs. You can shoot The Revenant. You can shoot a you know art house thing, Blair Witch Project, and you can cut through the clutter. And anybody who touches that project can do reputation enhancing work. And here's here's the kicker. Right, if you've made it this far in the podcast and suffered the slings and arrows of my bedhead, here here's the kicker for all of this: is that once you solve for that, then recruiting A players is a lot easier because they just want to do reputation enhancing work. Yeah, 
they just they just want to be able to go on the journey down the road with you. Let's say the typical A player, I'm not age discriminating, right? But let's say that generally speaking, it's somebody between 35 and 50 years old. Remember the first person to live to be 150 has already been born. I'm 58, okay? So I, clearly I got tons of energy. All right, so somebody who's 50 is not too old. But let's say, for example, it's a 35 to 50 year old person. It's critical to them to know how is this job going to contribute something lasting and meaningful to their reputation in the business? Yeah. They, they want to come in and help you go to the Super Bowl, and they want their fingers to be, their fingerprints to be all over that trophy. Yeah. That's really and truly what people want. And so if you think like a team owner, Jerry Jones or whoever owns a team, you know, Robert Kraft, you have, it's not just about we're going to get Tom Brady or Dak Prescott, or whoever it is, Amari Cooper. It's not just about that. It's here's what kind of an offense we're trying to build. Here's who else is going to compete against us in our division or in our league. Or here's how we're going to the Super Bowl and we're going to win. Yeah. That has to be baked into, you know, the premise of your approach talk to the A player. Does is that it, make sense? Yeah. Is it primarily a focus on, like, the exit? Is 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 that what the A players are looking for? Is like, oh, I do want to say that I've sold to a strategic buyer, right? And we had a huge hundred million plus dollar, you know, sell. Or is it just the vision of like, this is the movement that we're on, right? It could be eco-friendly products or we're saving the environment, right? Well, what, what is that? You know, because I think I've heard both things. Like some people are like, they want to join your mission, is it is it the mission or is it the the exit that like the long term vision that they're driving towards? It's none of the above. It's okay. the journey. And you know what? I'm shocked. Get, go to harryjoiner.com. It sounds like I'm fishing for leads. Most of your audience members are not going to be clients or candidates of mine, so I'm just trying to be helpful with all of this. But go to harryjoiner.com. <clears throat> and I actually asked this question yesterday in a poll on my LinkedIn profile. And most of the people said, basically, let's say, you, I think the way I worded the question was, let's say you have two competing job offers. <clears throat> One is from Patagonia. You know, who doesn't love Patagonia? That's like motherhood and apple pie, all about saving the planet. And they gave yeah. their, you know, the value of the company to the poor, whatever it is they did, they, they're amazing. All right, and let's say that Death Star International also has given you a job offer and both job offers expire at 5 p.m. tomorrow. You can see this poll on my LinkedIn profile. Patagonia, Death Star. How much more does Death Star have to offer you in terms of base salary for you to take their deal? Mm. $20,000, $40,000, $60,000, or $80,000? Most of the people didn't even say they needed $80,000. Most of the people would sell their souls to the Death Star for less than $80,000 a year. You know what that says? That says that people are full of shit. Mm. That's what that says. Uh, maybe you can edit that, I don't know, but that's what that says, is that people will just, they, it's nice to save the planet, but like at the end of the day, hey dude, I got kids to feed. That's what that says, Yeah. right? So what I think, and I'm not poo-pooing Patagonia's mission, and I'm not saying that I want to run human resources for Death Star International. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that in general, people will sell their souls to work on the Death Star and not even for the maximum amount of money in my poll. Go look at it yourself. Okay, so what people want is they want to do reputation-enhancing work. When John Travolta signed up to play the part of Vincent Vega for less than the maximum amount of money with Pulp Fiction, he wanted what he would become as a result of that. Mm. That's what he wanted. Okay. He wanted to get to know Quentin Tarantino, Sam Jackson. He wanted to know the crew. He wanted to know the investors. He wanted to know Harvey Weinstein. He wanted to know, he wanted to get in with a different crowd. Yeah. He wanted to play a different part. He wanted to broaden his horizons. That's what that was. Right. Yeah. And so it's, you know, what's, What's the benefit of getting to this point? When you get to this point, I'm glad I had this picture. When you get to this point, what do you get? Well, you get maybe, if you get options, a bag of money, and then you have a new boss. Yeah. Right? 
because the big dumb pharma company that bought you, now they're the boss. And so this yep. entire cast and crew, they're now reporting to the boss man or woman, yep. wherever they are. So at that point, there's no psychic income for the person. The value of the opportunity is the skills, the abilities, the talents this person will cultivate, what they learn, who, who they get to know, what they will do, right? That's really what life is about. Yeah, yeah. I, I love sense? that. Yes, that, that is a, that's a fantastic mindset shift. And again, it goes back to, I just had this experience with our VP of operations. He left his former job because he felt like he'd kind of tapped out his potential in terms of learning. He'd gotten it to this point and he was like, yeah, I don't see where I'm going to push myself or grow further. And then he saw, you know, he'd stumbled upon our job listing and he saw like, these are the challenges that I would love to take on because I'm going to learn new skill sets. I'm going to learn more about Amazon. I'm going to learn more about, you know, just D to C. And this is a different opportunity to take them to the next level. But through that process, and I'm kind of teaching myself as I go through this, mm -hmm. through that process, he knew the skills, talents he would develop with us. And that's why he was willing to say, hey, I, I do want to join you, you guys. You might be a smaller business than what I was currently working for, but the person I'm going to become through this process is going to be reputation enhancing. So I love that's that. Right. That's, that's and great. one other thing that I'll piggyback onto that because you just nailed it. All right. But one other thing that I will say here is that notice how much the business is changing for DTC right there. Right. Yeah. And so if you have a, let's say, what is this? Five, one, two, three, four. So let's say that this is a five year job. End of year 22, 22, 22, okay, I'm looking at it in reverse. Um, basically, what this is, is it's not, I mean, this is a five-year job, but for this, the person who runs this, this is more like a three-year job, or actually, it's like a one-year job three times. For yeah. this B2B, you know, it's more like a two-and-a-half-year job that you've had twice. Right, the sexiest, coolest, funnest job in the entire house is going to be this green one right there. Yep. And so that's the thing. If if somebody's with you six years, you need to make sure that they get six years experience once, not one year's experience six times or two years experience three times or whatever. People want to do reputation enhancing work. They want their they want their reputation to precede them. Right. By the time Harry Joyner shows up to a meeting. People know he's a recruiter, an e-commerce recruiter, and they, you know, that whatever discussion there's been about Harry Joyner has been on the basis of he's this ninja e-commerce recruiter. Yeah. And so when I go in to meet anybody or I talk to anybody on a Zoom call or what, like, I don't have to prove myself. My reputation has preceded me. It doesn't mean I'm smart. It doesn't mean I'm handsome, clearly, whatever. It just means that my reputation as an e-commerce recruiter has preceded me. I'm like an ice pick, okay? I'm, I'm absolutely priceless if you need an ice pick, and I'm worthless if you don't. <laughs> and th Makes that's, sense. That's what most people want by the time they get into their 50s. If their reputation is preceding them, they want to be like Meryl Streep or Eric Clapton or, you know, um, anybody who's older, but they're well-known for one thing. And they yeah. don't claim to fame stuff to support that contention that they're the ice pick for that one thing. Here's the guy who built company X, took it from a $17 million thing to a $32 million thing, but built a $19 million DTC business up from $5 million. This green line is going to be the basis of a claim to fame for any candidate. That's what they want to hear about. Does that make sense? I love that. Yes, it, it makes perfect sense. And Man, it's such a great mindset shift. And Harry, I mean, we've we've gone over our kind of initial time that we were talking about doing this podcast, but I think this has been so valuable, um, not only for myself, but I think for our listeners to have a completely different way to approach the way you're hiring people and the way that you're casting your vision for your business. Harry, I've got a few kind of quick spitfire questions that I'm going to ask you here to kind of wrap things up wrap things up. But before I get to that, I love to leave the audience with three actionable takeaways from each episode. Here are the three takeaways that I noted, Harry. Let me know if you think I'm missing something here. Um, I would say action item number one 
is to, if we go back to the beginning of the podcast, is the comment you made about your father, your business strategy should be your exit strategy. Yeah. I think that's where it, that's where it all begins. And you listed five different ways that you're essentially going to, you know, exit your business, whether you do it by choice or it just happens as a natural consequence of your sure. inaction, so to speak. Right. Yeah. Um, that's gotta be, that's gotta be action item. Number one, you've got to get very clear with like, what is that exit strategy look like for you? And even if you're the type of person that's like, I want to hold this in my family for eternity. Okay. Well, if that's your approach, then start formulating what that's going to look like. Um, action step number two is you have to start understanding your business and the financials. Um, we talked about this and you shared so many examples of you've got to know your average order value. You've got to know your repeat purchase rate. You've got to know how many units you're selling, like how many are repeat purchases versus new purchases versus old customers buying old products and old customers buying new products, right? You've got to know the intimate details of your numbers because if you don't, it, you're going to have a problem when we get to step number three here. And step number three and action item number three, I would say, is you've got to cast a vision of what your exit is going to be. Where are you going in the future? What is your five to seven year plan look like? And how are the people that you are trying to recruit or bring onto your team, especially A players, how is what you're trying to employ them to do going to be reputation enhancing for them? And you've got to get very clear with that. Um, I love the John Travolta analogy that you shared with us there. People are willing to take maybe even a pay cut to join your mission if they feel like the reputation enhancing, you know, uh, experience that they're going to get outweighs, you know, the monetary compensation. And so I think for business leaders and CEOs, if you genuinely want to take your business to the next level, you've got to get really good at all three of those action items that we shared today. What do you think, Harry? Anything else you would add? I, th I think that's right. For anybody who made it this far into the podcast, I, th I would say thank you. Um, I, you know, I have a process for all of this, right? If anybody wants to call and just chat about any of this, it's so I, I really, I want to stress, I didn't go to Harvard. I never worked for McKinsey. I didn't go to Wharton. It's none of what I do. It's, it's all designed to be, it's very back of the envelope stuff. And so in this example, I mean, this example, I made it up. I mean, this is, could have been any client, you know, that I've worked with. Um, I hear all the time, well, we want to be 17 million and we're looking to grow to 32 million in the next five years. I mean, and where does that number come from? Well, an entrepreneur just thinks, well, I hope to be twice as big. That's where the number uh -huh. comes from. They just pull it out of the air. And I don't fight them on that. I just say, okay, hypothetically, let's say you doubled the size of your business. What percentage of that would be DTC? What percentage of that would be Amazon? What percentage of that would be Target, Walmart, eBay, Overstock? What percentage of that would be domestic versus international? What percentage of that, you know, and what percentage of that would be 1P versus 3P blend versus blended 1P, 3P, right? And, but they might yep. go, I don't know. And that, but that's okay too. I'm not condemning that because you'd have to be Karnak on Johnny Carson to know the answer to that. You'd have to be, you know, clairvoyant to understand that. What I really want is for the person to just broadly, vaguely know we're going west and we think we're going to Seattle, but we may change our mind when we get to Tulsa and start yep. heading down to San Diego. But we don't know. We'll, you know, we'll figure it out when we get to Tulsa. That's good enough. If I worked for McKinsey, that you paid me a ton of money for that. Mm -hmm. And so none of that is really hard. But like, as you start to grow your business, this time next year, when you think about all of this again, you would know, okay, so Tulsa is in another 24 months. I'm going to have to make the decision. So as I look at my business from last year, what did we do right? What did we do wrong? What should we copy? What is nobody doing? How did we do old to old, old to new, new to old, new to new? It's just high level crap that any, trust me. I mean, if I can do it, you can do it. You just, it's just off the top of your head. 
You yeah. can do it with a six pack of beer and a legal pad and a football game in front of you. It's not designed to be. I have a process yeah. for it. If somebody wants to call me and learn more about the process, they're welcome. I love that, Harry. Um, you've shared so much value on the podcast today. As we wrap up, here are my quick fire uh, questions for you. What's been the most influential book in your life and why? You know what I would do? Like, let's assume that my home office burned down because I would probably have 500 business books in my home office. And I could only buy, you know, I'd spend $200 on books the day after my home office fire. I would just go buy all of the Dan Kennedy books on Amazon. Mm. Just go clean out Amazon, Dan Kennedy books. No BS pricing, no BS marketing, no BS direct marketing, no BS, you know, the, the ultimate sales letter, just all of them. All of them. Awesome. Next Makes question. sense. I, I'm a big fan of Dan Kennedy as well. I agree with that. What is your favorite productivity tool or resource? Financial calculator. I mean, literally yeah. old school. I, I'll tell you what it is. Like, for real. For real. A five by eight note card. Mm. I've kept it really and truly. A calculator and a five by eight note card. And you just got it right Everything there. Everything I do down is your five notes. by eight note card. I've got piles of them in my home office that, you know, from 18 years of drawing out five by eight note cards. Those are that. awesome. Hey, old school. Yeah, it's easy, actionable. I think it also helps your mind clearly. Like there's something to put in pen to paper that, that helps draw out strategies and thoughts. I like that. All right. Last question for you here, Harry. Who is someone that you admire most or that people should be paying attention to in the e-commerce space? Oh, in the e-commerce space. I, so I've got three people. Can I give you three people? Yep. That'd be perfect. I know one of them. The other two, I don't know. But I, I'm big fans of theirs. One is Andrew Udarian mm -hmm. with e-commerce fuel. Yep. I think he's so smart and I'm such a fan and I think he's great. And uh, some of the people that he has on his podcast are phenomenal. Bill D'Alessandro, I think, is on his podcast a lot. He, he's wicked smart, too. Uh, yeah. Okay, so that's one. Number two would be uh, Bill Lapierre with Data Man, who has a blog post that comes out once a week, and, and his blog is fantastic, and he's great. So Bill Lapierre with Data Man two N's at the end of that, D-A-T-A-M-A-N-N. -A -A -N. Okay. And the third one I've never spoken to either, but he's sort of a hero of mine, is uh, Kevin Hillstrom with Mind That Data. That guy, my IQ is lost in the rounding of that guy's IQ. He's a mm. freak. He's hella smart. So awesome. anyway. Those are some great recommendations, answer. and people can go check out uh, the content that they're putting out. But also, Harry, you've already mentioned it uh a few times on this podcast, but if people want to learn more, they're interested in your services, where should people go to learn more about you or even to consider working with you? Yeah, just go to harryjoiner.com, H-A-R-J-O-I, and join me, Harry Joiner. You can Google them all over the web. Uh, my websites are cmosearch.com, um, ecommercejobs.com, and ecommercerecruiter.com. So if you need e-commerce people, Alan and I would be happy to spend some time on the phone with you teasing out your needs there. But if you just want to, you know, follow any of my LinkedIn stuff, a lot of people do. It's there at harryjoiner.com. Awesome. Well, Harry, thank you so much for your time today. You've dropped a lot of knowledge bombs with us all. I know I'm. Uh, you've taken away a lot of action items for my own team from this podcast. So thank you so much for your time. And, uh, we'll look forward to connecting with you again in the future. Thank you for listening. Visit ecombreakthrough.com for more information. If you've enjoyed today's episode, the best way you can show your appreciation is by clicking the subscribe button and quickly leaving a review. See you again next time.